Your uh, longtime trainer, Todd Durkin, once said that he could see you giving up all your personal records for uh, the, a Super Bowl uh, victory. And you said recently, though, that um, if you had a choice between being a Hall of Famer or being a Super Bowl champion, you'd be a Hall of Famer. And to me, that's obvious. I mean, there are far fewer Hall of Famers than there are Super Bowl champions, but some people were actually surprised by that, I guess. Um, so if you wouldn't mind to explain the you know, thought yeah, process. Yeah, you know, that. here's the thing. Would I would have loved to win a championship? Absolutely. I feel like everything that I sacrificed individually, when I wasn't training with my teammates, when it was just me by myself, out there running hills, you know, busting my butt by myself, you know, I was doing it individually for the team, you know? And, and so on my way to trying to win a championship, I became a Hall of Famer individually because of the things that I was, you know, doing on the field, the numbers that I was putting up, you know. And then, you know, as a kid, I remember I always, you know, I just always wanted to be remembered in this game, you know, as, as one of the greatest running backs. That, that was, you know, one of my goals. That was one of my biggest goals. And so, you know, I just feel like the Hall of Fame is more exclusive group. You know, you have 60 guys every year that win the Super Bowl. You have five to seven every year that may go into the Hall of Fame. It's a more exclusive group. Why decide to retire? Well, you know, when I first started playing football in the NFL, I, you know, I, I imagined that I would play right around 10 years. I mean, because I was a guy that, you know, I did the research on, on how, how long NFL running backs lasted in the league, and it was, you know, three years. And if he was good, then you can go seven years. If he was very good, you can go 10 years or plus. Right. And so I just felt like I would love to play 10 years, you know. But I always knew that I had something else I wanted to accomplish in my life, you know, other than football. Now, I got to the point where um, you know, outside things, having a family, kids, you know, a wife started to pull me away. And I'll tell you what happened, you know, my last year, I recall, I was laying in the hotel room, it was Saturday evening, and we was getting ready to play the next day, we was on the road. Mm -hmm. And I called my wife, and I said, hey, what are you guys doing? And she said, oh, you know, I took the kids to the museum, you know, we're just walking around. And that was the first time I ever felt like I didn't want to be playing football no more. Really? I wanted to be, you know, with my family. And whenever that starts to happen, the distraction that takes you away from the game, then for me it's time to leave the game. The game is no longer important to me. And that's when you get hurt, you know, that's when you don't perform at the same level anymore because your interest is not there to play football. And so I knew at that point that it was the beginning of the end was coming. And then I made the decision, you know, past June, you know, gave myself six months or so. And then I made the decision that it was time to walk away. And did you realize it at that time? Yeah, I pretty much realized it. I mean, you know, at the beginning of the year, I was thinking to myself, this may be my last year. And, you know, uh, as every game went by, you know, I started to think to myself, you know, I only got 12 more games that I will ever play football, never strap it up again. You know, and it started to get emotional at times, you know, as I walked through that building. This is the last time walking down these halls, hallway. You know, things like that, I knew inside. And yeah, I, you know, I, I fought it for a little while and said, you know what, no, I'm gonna play. But I knew inside that it was time to leave. It was time to go because that was the right time for me where I wouldn't cheat the game. I wouldn't cheat the game and just, I always said, you know, some guys say, no, make them, make them kick you out. You know, get as much money as you can. But for me, it was never about the money. You know, I could never just play the game just for money. I played it because I loved it and I gave everything that I had. And at that point, I just couldn't do it no more. You mentioned you gave yourself an additional you know, several month period of time before you made that final decision. During that period, when were, were what were those moments like when maybe doubt or you, second thoughts came to mind? Yeah, it, it was, you know, talking to family members, 
You know, that, that was the hardest thing, you know, because talking to family members, you know, even though, <clears throat> excuse me, I knew that, okay, I feel like I'm, I'm ready to be done. And then family members would say, no, you know, give it one more chance, you know. You know, you still can play and you got a chance to win a championship. And you think about that. And then I talked to my old ball coach, Marty Schottenheimer, and, you know, he says, LT, you know, I can never tell you exactly what to do. All I'll say is this, if not this year, then next year. If not next year, then that next year. You know, and he just put it in perspective that the beginning of the end, the end is coming. You know, this is the beginning, the way you feel. And so I just had to come to realize that, you know what, at the end of the day, it's about how I feel, you know, and it was time. Coming out of college, uh, you had some media scouting reports basically projecting you as an NFL bust. Uh, much later on, you had a conversation with Michael Jordan once you know, at the Celebrity Golf Tournament, and you asked him basically kind of a, about staying motivated, uh, I believe. W what did he tell you? You know, one of the interesting things he told me, he said, you know, every day, you know, the, when he plays a game, you know, he always thinks there's somebody in that stadium, in that gym that's never seen him play and he wants to put on the show. He wants that, that one person that's never seen him play to go, to go away saying, wow, I seen Michael Jordan play. That was impressive. He said that's how he stayed motivated. And you know, I started to do the same thing. You know, as I get ready for games, I would say to myself, there's someone in here never seen me play in this stadium live. I'm gonna put on the show today. And you know, there's just little things like that that keep you motivated, but that was one thing that I remember that MJ told me. I want to take you back to your college days. There's uh, an interesting story that I think tells a, a lot uh, about your character. Uh, when, when you were actually arrested for marijuana, um, how well do you recall what transpired on that front? And I should say wrongly arrested. Yeah, I had always heard from my mom you know, be careful who you hang around. Everybody's not your friend. You know, everybody, everyone doesn't have your best interests in mind. And I was simply about to go out to a party that night with some of my buddies, you know, a, a guy that I went to school with who has some of his friends come down from his hometown and, you know, they're doing their thing. I had no part in it, but I'm part of the party, mm -hmm. you know, all of a sudden, Things go bad, you know, police come, everybody gets arrested. You know, so that's one of them situations where you, you know, taught me a valuable lesson. Right. You know, watch where you are and everybody is not your friend. You got to take control of your own life. Why demand to be tested? Well, I mean, because, you know, I wanted to prove my innocence. And, w and was this to the, the new coach? Yeah, that was, this was to the new coach. I was still, he was just coming in and he didn't know me from Adam. How, how did that conversation well, go? Well, you know, it was, you know, it was one of those things where, you know, he was like, I'm, I'm disappointed in you. You're becoming one of the leaders of this team. I'm disappointed. Coach, I had nothing to do with it. I, I wasn't smoking. I wasn't doing anything. I was just getting ready to go out to a party. Test me if you want. Right. You know, it was like, one of them conversations, okay, well, you know, I'll test you. Went down to the trainer's office, test me. You know, he called me back up in the office. He said, you were right, you know, you were negative. Stop hanging around, you know, these knuckleheads. Yeah. <laughs> that was kind of how the conversation went from Coach Fran. And you was know, that kind of the takeaway from that? Sometimes you, you know, as a as a young man, you know, mom mom don't know what she's talking about, but mom always know. Yeah. You know, and so it was just kind of one of them things where you know the coach had to kind of, you know, drill it in. Hey, stop hanging around knuckleheads. These guys are not your friend. You're going somewhere. They're not. So uh, overcoming adversity, I mean, seems to be a common theme throughout your athletic career. Coming out of college, you had a report commission that would basically project where you'd go in the NFL if uh, you decided to come out early. How frustrating were the results of that report for you? 
Well, it, it was a, a shock to, to my system. You know, it was really, you know, eye-opening to, you know, they was projecting me to go third round. You know, and I felt like looking at, for one, I felt like the things that I had just done, you know, it was, I know it was my first year starting, but I led the lead, I led the nation in rushing over a guy, you know, in Ron Dane who was projected to go first round, you know, and I was gonna go third round. So in, in other words, they was telling me that there was 15 other running backs at the time that was better than I was. And so, you know, it just motivated me more than anything. I mean, I- And largely I, because of where you went to school, you think? Right, okay. absolutely. You know, because I went to TCU and I didn't get much exposure. Right. You know, it wasn't, wasn't a, a national, um, you know, program, a dominant program. Or the big schools, Texas, you know, Oklahoma, these teams didn't take a look at me because really they didn't know who I was. Teams, you know, in college, they already have they, they picks. Going into the senior year, they already target the guys they know they want to offer scholarships to. And at that point, it's all about just monitoring how well they do their senior year. Well, I wasn't on these guys' radar, you know, and so I didn't get the opportunity. And so, you know, but going back it was the same thing but it, you know it motivated me for my senior year in college i put that that stat up on the wall you know what they were you know what the uh, scouts were saying about me my strengths my weaknesses while i was projecting i put it up on my wall in my room i looked at it every day and and as i went out the room you know going for the day going to school and practice i would look at it and it was instilled in my mind and another thing i used to do you know, I used to tape my wrist, and I used to write underrated on it, you know, so I can always see that, you know, during the game. And the other one I would write, feed the family, you know. And so things like that just, I think it, it drove me and motivated me. How about the uh, funniest experience you ever had from bringing somebody with you hmm. to participate in the workout? Yeah, <laughs> uh, that would be my good buddy Reggie Bush. He actually, when he was still at USC, you know, I think it was his junior year, you know, he come to work out with me. And, uh, you know, we get about, you know, 20, 25 minutes into the workout, and he said, hold on, I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so he walks out, and I kind of followed him, and he gives it up, you know. He's throwing up everywhere. I said, buddy, you okay? <laughs> you know, he's like, man, this is hard, you know. And, and that was one of the funniest things because, you know, what he said to me afterwards, he said, you know what, thank you, because I now realize what it takes to, to, to be the best. I'm nowhere close, you know, I need to get after it. And so that was one of the funniest things, just to watch a young up and coming, I mean, it's Reggie Bush. And tell about the first time uh, Todd Durkin put you through a workout. Well, I thought he was crazy. You know, <laughs> I, th I thought Todd was crazy, but, you know, I needed that challenge. You know, I, I just felt like, you know, it was something that, <clears throat> you know, it was hard for one. I mean, hey, you know, could you to, feel it pretty quickly? Oh, oh, yeah, I could feel it quickly, you know, because it was different. You know, just the type of jumps and the type of things that, you know, he had you doing. It was a workout I had never done before. And it really, I mean, it really showed me my weaknesses. Did, did it bruise the ego at, oh, at all? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. You know, here I'm thinking, I'm this, you know, big time right. NFL running back. And I'm getting broke off by this dude, you mm -hmm. know. I, I mean, I, I look like an amateur, you know. And so, it, you know, but at the end of the day, it was like I knew, you know, that it was paying off. I can just see little things start to change. I just start to become, you know, for one, my body started to change. I, you know, became real lean and, and explosive, you know, right away. And on the field, I mean, there was times where I just felt like if I'm standing in front of you, I can do a move where you would never touch me, you know, and we can be as close as, you know, six inches and I can do a move and you wouldn't touch me. I felt like that and that was because of them workouts that Todd put me through. How, how do you feel those workouts impacted your ability as a player? Well, I, I think for one, it just made me, you know, more explosive and a quicker guy. Like I can make lateral And, and explain movements. some of the things you, you guys would do too. Yeah, like we would work on a lot of lateral movements, you know, like a lot of, uh, you know, jumps from side to side with explosion. 
the thing that I noticed the most was my lateral movement. My ability to, to jump cut, what I call it, is when you start over here and then you jump cut laterally, you know, uh, to the other side. And so my ability to do that was, I mean, it was second to none. I mean, people would talk about that, that ability. And it came from, from the things that Todd and I used to do during our workout, the lateral explosion jump cuts that we used to do off a, a, a half BOSU uh, ball. And so um, things like that, you know, it was just, it was something that was different. You know, it was, it was functional movement training is what I call it. Because if you think about it, it's exactly what skill players, running backs, cornerbacks, receivers, that's the type of training we need because you're never gonna, you're never gonna be on the football field on your back bench pressing somebody. If you are, you're getting your butt kicked. You know, that means somebody's on <laughs> right. top of you, you're like, get off of me. You know, so it's all about working on your feet and learning how to do explosive moves on your feet while you're moving. Most satisfying victory of your career would be what? New England. New England divisional game in Foxborough. It's cold, um, really cold, and you know, everybody had talked about New England being at home and they're going to blow us out. Earlier that year, on Monday night, they beat us like 45 to 3. I mean, they blew us out. And so everybody was expecting the same thing. And we won that game. You know, I think we forced Tom Brady into several turnovers, sacked him. Defense really played well. We played well on offense and beat New England and Foxborough went on to the AFC Championship game. So that probably would be the most most satisfying victory. Speaking uh, of college, and I, I don't really know how to put a positive spin on this, uh, when it comes to uh, your, your dating life, somebody, <laughs> somebody told me this, um, that before you ever took your now wife, Latorsha, out on a date, before you ever even met her, you just watched her walk around campus for well, something like two months. It wasn't that long. I mean, that you know, that's ridiculous. It wasn't two <laughs> months, but I, you know, what was going on was I was, you know, I was scouting her. You know, I was, you know, if you know. What does that mean? That's what well, Greg told me, dude. What yeah, is scouting you know, when her? You scout he's someone. like he'd come home, man, I met this girl. And <laughs> he said you never even talked to her when you said that. Yeah, no, I, I just wanted to see, you know, when you scout someone, it means to, you know, to kind of, uh, you know, to check them out, to, uh, you know, know their features, you know, to see what kind of person they are, you know, in terms of if, if you're a scout for uh, an NFL team, you go, out, you go out and scout quarterbacks or running backs, you scout them, you Isn't break that down. Isn't that called stalking, though? No, it's when not it stalking. When it comes to dating. No, because I had other people doing it for me. I wasn't, I wasn't the guy doing it. I had other young guys doing it, you know, so some of the young football players, I said, hey, Hey, go see, you know, what that girl is doing. Go see what classes she has. Go see what time she eats lunch. That's scouting, you know, that's, that's, there's nothing wrong with that, you know? And so I scouted her for a little while until I, you know, it was time to draft her. And, Dra I drafted what, and what does uh, drafting her mean? Well, that means, you know, trying to see if she can fit, you know, on, on the roster. See if she can be part of the team and be my quarterback, you know? <laughs> I love these football analogies. Yeah, exactly. uh, how, how'd the first date go? The first date was good. I took her to IHOP. I mean, I didn't have much money. I was in college, you know, so I, cu I couldn't take her to Root Chris or, you know, Morton's or anything. Sure. I took her to IHOP, and she, it, was, it was a hit. IHOP was a hit. We must have stayed there like two or three hours just talking, and, you know, from that point on, we, we never stopped talking again. Did you really talk about your mom the entire date? I talked about my mom the majority of the day because I knew that women, you know, that's the one thing that they want to know, your relationship with your mom. If he treats his mom right, then I know he'll treat me right. You know, that's what my wife used to always say. And so, you know, it was part of, of the game plan to talk about my mom, you know, get her comfortable. It worked. Your wife said for a while you were like borderline addicted to having kids. <laughs> and uh, so tell about the time uh, you show up at uh, the Chargers Stadium when you were playing for San Diego 
and you see a purple bag in your locker. Yeah, it was a, uh, you know, it was a uh, great day. Uh, we was getting ready to play the Philadelphia Eagles at home. And, you know, it was funny because before the games, you know, I don't really like to talk. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm already getting into a zone, getting focused, and I, I really don't like to talk at home, you know, to my wife or my mom or anybody. And they know that. You know, but for some reason, my wife was just talkative that, that, that morning. And, you know, I'm kind of short, grumpy a little bit, you know. And, and before I leave the game, for the game, you know, she's like, you're going to be so mad at yourself. <laughs> I'm thinking, like, why? Whatever, you know. And I get to the stadium, and I see this little box. I'm thinking, like, what is this? And I read, you know, I see a, a note from your wife. I'm like, what is she doing getting me a gift before the game? This is weird. You know, and I, I open it up, and it's a pregnancy test. You know, and it says, um, you know, it says, yes, you know, like, or where it says pregnant. And, uh, you know, I just, I was so emotional. What did you, you know? do? Well, I just sat down in my locker. I couldn't believe it, you know, because, you know, we, we had went through a tough period where, you know, we had got pregnant. My wife was six months pregnant. And she lost the baby. And, you know, we stopped trying for a little while for years. We, you know, we didn't even try to have kids. And then for that to happen, it was just, you know, it was emotional because losing a child and now, you know, getting ready to have another one was, was just the best feeling in the world. I want to talk to you kind of about your mentality and your mindset when you're playing. When you're in the backfield, um, what do you see? Well, I'm always, a, you know, I've been taught to kind of, you know, pre-snap read is what we call it. And that's kind of read the defense, you know, see what's going on, see the position of the linebackers, safeties, defensive line. And so, you know, there's a certain zone and focus you got to have for one when you're in the backfield because, you know, that's you know, running back, you get hit from all different type of angles and you got to really have it in your mind where everybody is on the field, you know, in order to stay healthy because the guy that you don't see is the guy that hurt you. And so as a running back, I always, you know, can see the whole field. That was one of my greatest gifts is the vision to see. And so uh, I would always, you know, check out the defense. And when I, I knew the play already, so I had an idea of how the defense looked, where the ball possibly could go. And so sometimes it worked out how I thought it would, and sometimes it didn't. And sometimes you would just have to improvise and, and, and fight and claw to try to get two yards. And so for me, I think, like I mentioned, that was just, that's probably the greatest thing for me is just to be able to, to see the whole field and know where everybody's at. What do you hear? Nothing. Nothing. You know, not you know. Before the play, I obviously hear the crowd. You know, you hear all kind of things, but it's so weird because once you get the ball, there it's complete silence. You know, it's just everything is moving in slow motion, and then after the play, you hear the crowd again. But the focus that you got to have, you know, that sense of, of concentration and determination, I guess, takes away from the other senses of, of your hearing. And, and what do you mean everything's in slow motion? Well, you know, because I think, like, you can see things happening. I mean, it's, it's really weird because when you get the ball, you can see your linemen starting to take off and block. And you can see the linebackers starting to fit where they're supposed to fit. What I mean by that is each linebacker and defensive player has a, a certain gap that they have to be at. They have to control that gap on the football field. And so you can see them guys starting to, you know, run to their gaps. And you can see your linemen start to, you know, as they head on their angle to block somebody. And then you start to see in slow motion where the hole may be, you know, how the hole is forming. And then, you know, it's just, your body just does it. You know, it's weird, like, I've never tried to do anything. Spin move, jump cut, it's all off reaction for me, uh, just reacting. How, how long has it been slow for you? Right around, I guess, you know, my sec end of my second year and my third year, things started to really slow down for me. My rookie year, you know, things were, you know, we're going so fast for me because I was trying to 
you know, learn the NFL game, learn how to read defenses, and learn how to, you know, learn what my guys out there are doing. You know, that's one of the most important things you got to do as a running back is know who's blocking for you, know who's supposed to block who. And my rookie year, I didn't know who was supposed to block who. I was just out there running. And when you're out there just running, everything is in fast motion. And you said it momentarily gets blurry, too? Yeah. Um, in what ways? Well, you know, I, I talked about, you know, getting blurry sometimes is not a good thing. You know, there was times where, you know. Is that I just would, because you're concussed or something? Well, or? I, I don't know if it's concussed, but there was times where, you know, you'll get dinged a little bit. And, you know, for a second, you know, you'll be blurry. But, you know, it, it never was a time where I went into the next place still blurry. You know, just for a second, you know, you'll you know, see stars or whatever they uh -huh. say, you know, is the definition that they use for being blurry. And for a second, you'll be blurry a little bit, but then, you know, before the play, it'll come back and you just keep playing. Uh, I want to touch on some notable moments from your career and just name the moment and get you to kind of recall what you remember. You're in the NFL and your Chargers beat the Dallas Cowboys and your boyhood idol, Emmett Smith. Yeah, rookie year. That was a, it was a special moment. It was, it was a very emotional moment for me. And here's why. Uh, coming back home as a rookie, Cowboys were my childhood team, you know, my family. We, every Sunday, we would, you know, watch the games on TV. That was part of the family ritual. Go to church, come home, you, you surround the TV, watching TV and, and, and eating. And so I had already always dreamed about, you know, being in the National Football League. And I think that day it, it hit me that I was I was here. And I remember, you know, I had my family in the stands. I was coming back home and I remember as a kid, you know, going to a game, going to a cowboy game, you know, and I got to the stadium and I just couldn't believe it. I, I couldn't believe that I was here. I was there. It was almost a surreal moment that I was playing in the NFL, you know, and my, my dream had come true. Uh, uh, you know, my childhood dream had come true. And so right as I'm getting ready to, to walk out or uh, be announced, run out the tunnel, you know, I could see my mom and my dad and stuff, and I just started crying. You know, I, I started, I just, I was so overwhelmed that you know, because it was like, you know, I, f I made it, you know, I made it here, you know, in front of my my mom, my dad, you know, my family, you know, and we won the game, so it was, oh, it was extra special. I remember it like it was yesterday. It, it still makes you a little emotional oh, now. Oh, yeah, it does, you know, because, it, you know, my father's passed now, and mm -hmm. so that's one of the memories that I have of him, you know, and that, now that he's passed, so it's, it's emotional. What, what was it about that game, though? Um, well, I think the fact that a, a guy, Emma Smith, that I looked up to and, and gave me plenty of, of pointers of how to be a successful running back and NFL player, the fact that, you know, he was on the opposite sideline as well. And, <laughs> I mean, it was a surreal moment. It really was. Now, uh, rewinding a little bit back to my childhood when I, I first – encounter Emma Smith was I was in junior high and I ended up going to uh, you know a football camp one of his football camps and that moment kind of changed my life in terms of you know the belief that hey maybe one day I can I can do it maybe if I work hard enough if I sacrifice you know I can be an NFL running back as well you know because coming from Waco I mean I would never known anybody who made it to the NFL or NBA or no no professional athletes, celebrities, movie stars, anything. And so all them people seemed like just, you know, that like they was these, uh, you know, some special figures, you know, Hollywood celebrities type people on TV. Right. And they wasn't really r real. Right. But going to the Emmitt Smith football camp and having a chance to, to talk to him and, and then when he, you know, he jumped in the running back line, I was, doing drills with the running backs. He comes over, 
he jumps in the line and starts doing drills with us. And that drill we were doing, we were handing off the football. Like someone handed it off to you, then you turn and hand it off to them, and then the line just keeps going and you keep doing it. Well, Emmett jumped in the line perfectly. I mean, it, it was over 20-some kids in that line. He jumps into the line and happened to be handing the ball off to me. How, I mean, you know, all the other kids that he could have been handing the ball off to me, he happened to be handing it off to me. And I, I remember kids trying to jump in front of me, and I'm like, no, no, no way, man. I'm getting all the handoffs from Emmett. You know, and so just that encounter, and then later on that day, I remember being back in the dorms, and it's the end of the day, and I'm going upstairs to get ready to eat dinner. And as I'm going up the stairs, Emmett is coming down. He almost knocks me over, you know, at the perfect time. I mean, surreal type stuff. He's walking down, and I turn the corner, and, and, and I'm like this, oh, hey, Emmett, as a kid, I'm 12 years old. You know, he's like, hey, little buddy, you okay? Okay, all right, go to dinner. And he was leaving. And so to fast forward this, this you know, what, Nine years now, fast forward nine years now, I'm on the same field, you know, remembering the stuff that happened in junior high, and I'm here at Dallas Cowboys Stadium as a rookie with my family in the stands. It, it just, I don't know, it was just a surreal moment. Was it equally as special for your parents? Oh, yeah. Yeah, because I, I think, you know, my parents realized, and particularly my mom, the sacrifice she, she had to make just to, you know, uh, you know, so I can go to that camp, you know, just saving a little money, you know, out of every paycheck so I can go to that camp, you know, sacrificing, you know, sometimes taking, you know, me and my brother to a Dallas Cowboy game, you know, being able to, to drive up from Waco to go to Dallas to the game, you know, things like that. I think she realized that, you know what, it all paid off. The things that I sacrificed for him to go to camps and to, have a chance to go to an NFL game, it's paid off. Your record-setting 31 touchdown season, best experience from that year would be what? Uh, best experience was when it happened. Um, at the moment when, when it was about to happen, just the look in my offense alignment's eyes, just saying, hey, let, you know, let's go get it. This is the run right here. We're going to do it. And the anticipation from everybody in the stands, you know, the crowd was going crazy. The owner and, and A.J. Smith and all them guys were on the field. And when I go back and look at it, you know, as I took the handoff, it was kind of like everybody stopped for a second. And it was like this, is he going to do it? Is he going to do it, you know? And once I crossed that goal line, I mean, the stadium erupted. You know, you see it, you know, the owner and everybody jumping up down, you know, uh, shaking hands and, and hugging each other. And then I, I look up in, in my family box and I see them going crazy, hugging each other. You know, it was a special moment. And then my teammates, you know, they all came and, and, and lift me up. And, you know, that was the most special moment because everybody knew that you know, we were getting close and, you know, it was about to happen. But, you know, to do it at home in front of your family, in front of your home crowd, in front of everybody that had a chance to see that run and break that record, that's the most special moment, you know, when it happened. How would you best explain the, the sacrifices that your mom made in raising you? You know, I, I think it's some only, you know, truly a mother can, can know. I can never imagine the type of sacrifices she made. What I did see was her working two and three jobs at times, just so, you know, we can have the things, food on the table, so we can, you know, get new school clothes, have new shoes, you know, things that, you know, sometimes kids take for granted. But, you know, her, you know, working hard, you know, doing things that I know she didn't want to do. I knew times when she got home and she was so tired, but still found time to love on us. You know, things like that, I can never imagine, you know, because I'm not a mother, you know, but I just, I mean, I appreciate it so much now looking back. I tell her all the time, I say, you know, mom, now that I got kids, 
you know, it's unbelievable the things that you gave up and the sacrifices you made, you know, for me and my, you know, my siblings. And I'm, I'm so appreciative to you for the things that you did. What do you think you most learned from your mom? Work ethic. I mean, work ethic, you know, I, you know, and I think that's why there's no way that I could, you know, sit home. And even though I'm retired from the NFL and I could pass, I could just sit home and do nothing. But the work ethic that she showed, you know, me growing up, seeing her leave at seven o'clock in the morning, come home at six at night, and then still cook dinner, you know, and, and I understood at a young age that that's what sacrifice and, and work ethic was all about, what she was doing. And it was no question that's, that's what I learned from her is, is work ethic. What do you, how well do you remember that letter that you wrote her when you were 17? I remember it, you know, because uh, it came from the heart. You know, it was just, you know, it was. Uh, at 17 years old? Yeah, yeah. Well, what did it say? Well, it was, I had, you know, I, I, w I had uh, done some things that, uh, you know, wasn't the best thing to do as, as a, a teenager, you know. I, you know, tried drinking some beer with some of my friends and stuff, and my mom found out about it, and she was very disappointed. You know, and I, you know, I wrote her a letter. I just basically said, hey, mom, I know, you know, this is the worst thing that I did, you know, that you can possibly imagine, you know, but <clears throat> one day I'm gonna make you, you know, the happiest mom in the world, you know, because I'm, I'm gonna go to college, I'm gonna get my degree, you know, I'm gonna go to the NFL, you know, I'm gonna buy you a new house and, and you know, you will never have to work again one day, I promise you, because, you know, I'm gonna sacrifice, I'm gonna work hard, you know, I, all that stuff. And, uh, you know, it brought her to tears. It was a special moment and she kept the letter. She kept it and many years later when I was in the NFL, she showed me that letter and I couldn't believe it. I'm like, you kept the letter? She's like, yeah, I kept it. Well, what's it like? now to have actually been able to buy her a house and support your mother in yeah. the way that you know she did for you for so many years it's the best feeling in the world for me I mean you know I feel like I did what I set out to do for my mother you know I said I would buy a new house and also then she would never have to work again if she didn't want to and she's been able to do that you know and so you, as a as a son being able to, you know, really take care of his mother. I mean, that's I mean that's things that don't don't happen often. You know, that's totally a blessing. The relationship with your father, uh, much different than that you had with your mother. Uh, your father was 15 years older than your mother. Right. Ended up having I think five kids out of wedlock. Um, they divorced, and when you were in your teens. He basically stopped coming around. Mm -hmm. What was that like going through it for you at that point? Well, at the point at the time, I, I didn't really understand it. You know, as a you know, as a young guy, a young kid, you don't understand why the he reason, wasn't coming around. Why you know he wasn't coming around, and then you know, as a teenager, you start to just get angry. You know, not knowing why and not seeing your dad. You know, but as I got older. And I was able to, you know, to talk to my dad and to have conversations with him about that type of stuff. I, I totally understood my dad. I mean, you know, my dad, you know, he was he was 15 years older than my mom when he married my mom. But before he married my mom, he had a, another family. You know, he had basically had, you know, four of the kids and a, and another a, a mar marriage, you know, and <clears throat> he eventually left that. You know, his family then married my mom, you know, had us, you know, but he was caught in between basically trying to raise two families. He had, you know, two boys. I mean, he had, you know, a host of boys, really, but he had a different family that he was trying to raise at the same time and still raise us, you know, and, and, and so he struggled with that and went back and forth, you know, from that family to, to our family. And so I, I totally understood, and I, not, you know, I didn't fault him for it because. How long did it take you to understand? Well, when I got to college, you know, I was able to 
have you know long conversations with him. I would just you know go to the house and sit down on, on the porch, sit down on the porch, and we would talk for hours just about certain things, you know. And, and you're a sophomore at TCU, yeah. And you decide to call your dad. How long it had it been at that point since both of you had spoken? Uh, probably, you know, a few years. Yeah, probably a few years. Why decide to call him then? Well, I, I think, you know, sometimes, you know, I think you got to do things, I don't know, you know, kind of, uh, you know, when you feel like it's the right time. You know, I, you know, I always felt like, you know, sometimes, you know, your heart will tell you when the right time is. You know, and for me, there was times where, like I said, I was, I was angry and didn't want to talk. You know, but then... Why, why, why do I have to be the one to reach out when right. you know, he's not reaching out and he's my father? Right, exactly, that type of thing. You know, but then, you know, I had to realize that, you know what, I have the means to, to reach out. I have a car. You know, I can make the, the first, you know, connection of, of going to see him, going to talk to him, whatever. You know, I can do that. I can be a bigger person and, and do that, you know. And so that was the reasoning in doing it. I was, I was really at the point where I, I really was no longer mad. I just wanted to understand him, you know, to understand the reasoning and, you know, going away and, you know, basically not talking for so long. And so, you know, that was what that was about for me. He ends up coming out to see a game, which to the best of your knowledge, I think at that point was the first time he would have been coming to a game since you were in Pop Warner football. What was that like, having him at the <laughs> collegiate game? Yeah, it, it was, uh, <clears throat> I remember the game, I was, I was pressing, which means I was trying to impress him. So I was doing things, you know, uncharacteristic of the way I would normally play. Like I was really trying so hard, you know, to, to make big runs and score touchdowns to impress my father. You know, and so it, it was, uh, you know, it was a lot of pressure because I wanted him to just say, hey, great game, son, proud of you. You know, but he did it anyway, you know, and so it really didn't matter how many yards or touchdowns I, I scored that day. You know, it, it was about him being there and just seeing me happy, you know, seeing me doing something that I love to do that I've been doing since I was a kid and that he introduced me to. Your father ended up passing tragically in a, a car accident. Mm -hmm. Even though you two weren't as close as you might be with your mother, how hard was that to go through? Well, it was still hard. I mean, because, you know, I have his last name. I carry on the last name, you know, and so that, you know, when the man that you have his last name, you know, passes away, that's, that's one of the toughest things, you know, that to go through. And, you know, I, I think the memories that I had of him were great memories. You know, even though there were times where he wasn't a part of my life, you know, that wasn't important to me, you know, really and truly, because it was all about the memories. What do you think you most learned from your father? I, you know, I, I think my heart, you know, just kind of the, the kind giving, you know, I, I think I have his spirit, you know, that type of mindset of wanting to help people, you know, and, and you know, giving to people. That's what I learned most because, you know, in, in the midst of him being, you know, caught up in two different families, you know, I realized that not only were he caught up in two different f families, that he was a guy that helped so many people. At his funeral, there were so many people that got up and said, if it weren't for this man, I don't know where I'd be. He was like a father to me. So many people, and you just never imagine, you know, the kind of impact that he had on other people is because of the way he was. I don't mean to harp on death, but I was speaking to your friend uh, Greg earlier today, and I guess I was unaware of you being close to Junior Seau, uh, when you learned that, you know, Junior t took his own life, I understand you were really devastated by it. What was your immediate reaction? Disbelief, 
Uh, just disbelief. I, you know, Junior, um, you know, he was Superman, you know, to me. Um, being a young rookie coming into the league and seeing a guy that, for one, if you knew Junior, <clears throat> you know, he was a guy that, for one, he never wanted to show his teammates he was hurt. He never got treatment in the training room around his teammates. He always got treatment at his house, somewhere where his teammates wasn't around because he always wanted to show the sign of strength. And, you know, I think when I first got to San Diego, just watching him, the way he operated, the way he did things, you know, I realized that that's what it took to be great. The way he, you know, the, the way he went about his business, the way he carried himself, the way he watched film, lifted weights, the way he practiced on the practice field. I thought he never, you know, I was like, man, how does this guy continue to run around and play like this and hit people and never get hurt? You know, so I, I felt like he was Superman. And so when I heard that he, you know, took his life, it was just disbelief, you know, it was like, no, why? You know, it just doesn't make sense. And it was a very difficult time. For you or the others that are close to him, given what you said about, you know, him kind of being Superman, is there um, some sense of, like, personal frustration among the people that knew him well that, man, you know, I wish we knew because here's a guy who helped all of us and we would have love to have been able to help as well. Yeah, that's, I mean, I think that's the most frustrating thing for all of us is, you know, we all felt like, you know, we were, we were friends and, you know, we knew Junior and he knew us and any time, you know, I mean, we were like brothers. We see each other, you know, as hugs and, you know, we're talking for hours, you know, and all of us that felt like we knew him, we, we had no idea what he was going through. That's the most frustrating thing, you know, to, to think you know, you know, your brother and to have no idea that he's thinking about taking his own life. It's unimaginable, you know, you just, I mean, to this day, I still question, you know, why, you know, how could no one not know? How about your fondest memory? of the time with him? Oh, man, well, you know, Junior, I mean, he told me where to propose to my wife. You know, he told me. First guy to rough, rough you up in yeah. your first training camp? Yeah, first guy, you know, to kind of introduce me to the NFL. You know, first guy to, um, to really welcome me to the team as a San Diego Chargers, uh, the rookie dinner. And so, uh, you know, I remember it was training camp and after practice, they called up practice. Coach said, Junior, you have something to say? He said, yeah, um, tonight we got rookie dinner. You know, LaDainian is taking us out to dinner tonight. Mm -hmm. I am? Yeah, you are. So, you know, I'm gonna pick you up at seven. Just be ready. And so, sure enough, it was IHOP you went to again, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> we went to a um, Board Steakhouse downtown San Diego, and so I get to the restaurant with Junior, and I walk into a private room with about twenty-five of my teammates. <laughs> <laughs> and, Cheap bill. Yeah, and I have the guest seat right in the middle, and guys are, are already, you know, they got drinks and. You know, it's a table full of food. Dream sex sat next to me. He said, you know, now this is how this is gonna work. You know, this is your formal introduction to the team. You know, after this, you're one of us, San Diego Charger. You know, but tonight, these guys gonna order whatever they want, as many drinks as they <laughs> want, and you're gonna pay for it. <laughs> you know, so it's kinda like, are you kidding me? Come on, Junior. You know, so these guys, I mean, they're living it up. They're drinking, they're eating. And the rule was, you, no individual can order just one drink. So if I was to order a drink, I got to order two. Even though I may not drink it, I just wanted, you know, that was the rule. So the bill comes, and it's about $18,000.
And, <laughs> and so I'm sitting here looking at this bill like, are oh, you kidding me? Come on, man. <laughs> and so, you know, the kind of guy that Junior was, he collected money from all the guys as a tip. You know, he collected a tip for all the guys. And, you know, I'm thinking like, oh, man, what is, what is he going to do with this tip? And he ends up giving, giving it to me, you know, as just a kind gesture. He didn't have to do that. I, that 18000 I was on my own. Yeah. You know, I've been a part of rookie dinners where one no tip, you know, mm -hmm. pay, the rookie got to pay for all of it. And so just the kind of guy he was, you know, he gave me the tip. You know, I guess it was a little over $1,000, but, you know, it helped. The general manager, A.J. Smith, how do you view him today? I think he's, you know, just he's one of the, the toughest GMs that we have in football. I mean, he's... Tough in what ways? Well, he, he's, he's a guy that, you know, he, he, there's his way to do things. Like, he feels like his way is the right way to build a team, and there's no change in that. You know, his way is the only way. It's, just, it's his way or the highway, as they say. And so, um, you know, when he's in that, in that position of power, you know, I, I just, you know, there was times where I just didn't understand certain decisions that was being made, you know, but at the same time, I was a player. So it really wasn't my position to, to question the decisions that was made. And so I just, I always felt like, you know, it was never the right thing, certain decisions. I, even though I, I played through it and I never really uh, publicly criticized A.J. Smith, I just felt like, you know, at some point this is going to backfire. Between letting then quarterback Drew Brees walk and then firing uh, head coach Marty Schottenheimer, how do you think that affected the Chargers' ability to win the Super Bowl? Well, you talk about camaraderie, you know, on the team, you know, when you get rid of certain guys, that hurts the camaraderie of the team, you know, because now you have to learn a new coaching staff, you have to learn a new quarterback, you know, and, and that may take you a couple of years to, to get used to a new coaching staff. And so at the, at the most critical time, I felt like when we was right there, where we was one of the most dominant teams in football, a change was ne was made that wasn't necessary, and it cost us, you know, in the end, we never won a championship, even though it seemed like we was right on the brink of winning one or two. Do you think you would have won if yeah. both of them stuck yeah. around? Really? Yeah, yeah we would have won, yeah. W what, why do you say that? Well, we, we, you know, Marty had built a team that was strong in all aspects. We can run the ball, we can throw, have, you know, we were a physical team on defense. We can get out to the, the quarterback. We could stop the run. We were good on special team. We, we had a, a solid team and everybody knew Marty's philosophy. We knew what Marty expected out of all of us. You know, that year with Phillip, Phillip was just, a, you know, he was a young quarterback. And so we really didn't want to open the offense up. You know, we was very conservative. We ran the ball very well. We was probably ranked number one in rushing, you know, but we had a young quarterback that we did want to, you know, um, you know, make him make mistakes, you know, force him into mistakes. So we played conservative football. If we would have had a, you know, experienced quarterback like Drew, we would have been able to, you know, open it up a little, little bit more you know, do more things, and, and we would have been even more dangerous. You, um, throughout your career, have been showered with praise for how humble you are, how kind you are, how generous you've been to countless people. But when you were released from uh, the, the Chargers, there was, I think for the first time, some people that were critical of, you know, some, some comments that you made. And I, I only thought it was worth bringing this up, given that the rest of your career has, I mean, everybody has only said positive things. And I'm sure you saw this article, but I wanted to read um, a quote to you that, and I'm just reading a couple excerpts, but I mean, some of the criticism seemed biting, and it was in the uh, San Diego Union Tribune. Um, it, it read, um, since being released by the Chargers, the great tailback once 
the most common among uncommon athletes, always the genuine humble superstar, has thrown so many people under the bus, it's become impossible <laughs> for him to drive it straight anymore. And the, the columnist goes on, there are uh, pyromaniacs who haven't burned this many bridges. LTO's an apology to his teammates, especially his uh, offensive line who supported him, his head coach, Nora Turner, the organization that made him a wealthy man, and most of all, the Chargers faithful who loved him so to the point of wearing number 21 to bed. Uh, the Chargers haven't always done so with their stars, but the team handled LT's release with class and integrity, and the columnist says, LT did not return the favor. Any truth to any of that? I think that was, you know, that was in response to, <laughs> I was already on the Jets team, and, you know, we were talented on the Jets, and, and it was, you know, the question was, is this the most talented team you've been on? And I said, yeah, possibly one of the most talented teams I've been on. We got a dominant defense, number one defense in the league, you know, we, we, we're top five in running the football. You know, we got a young quarterback in Sanchez that's up and coming. This is basically one of the most talented teams that I've ever been on. And people took, took exception to, you know, the things that I was saying about my new team, comparing it to my former team, saying, oh, you know, he's trying to say that the offensive line is not that good, you know, and all this kind of stuff, which I really wasn't. I've never bashed my offensive line, never, you know, and... And, and obviously it's water, water under a bridge now. You were loved then, you know, equally yeah. loved now, but did it, yeah. I mean, get to you that, I mean, everybody thought maybe you always said the right thing and for the first time you were maybe giving a little more than you'd otherwise give? Yeah, I mean, you know, to me, I, I just felt like it was the chance for somebody, you know, to to take a shot at me, you know, of some offset, you know. And like I said, I was on a new team. I was no longer thinking about the things that happened in San Diego. I was moving forward. I was talking about my current team and really pumping up my current team, and, you know. And, you know, it was just mind boggling that people, you know, someone, you know, a writer would take some things that I said and just kind of, you know, make it seem like I dogged my old team, you know, which that wasn't the case. Since you know him well and have been close friends for uh, a long time, uh, Drew Brees and the New Orleans Saints, Bounty Gate. Uh, your thoughts on all of that? Obviously, they say there are certain interviews that Roger has conducted that has turned down some, some information, but the public doesn't know that. And I, I think at this point, you know, we're kind of left up in the air to say, you know, what's true and what's not? How does one person get a year suspension and how does another person get six games? And the unfortunate thing is I feel for guys like Drew Brees, who was a main catalyst in turning around that organization. And now, you know, they're left to try to pick it, pick, pick the pieces up and try to get everybody back together with no coach, coach suspended for a full year. You know, but if that's the case, if there was some kind of bounty, then shame on them, you know, because the NFL, you know, we feel like we're a fraternity. And every guy, if you go down on that field, you'll see every guy stop for a moment and take a knee, you know, pray for him or whatever, because at the end of the day, when the game is over, I'm coming and shaking your hand, ground, you know, how's the family? Everybody's good? Okay, great, man. Tell the family, I say hi. Good luck, man. That's what the NFL is about. And, you know, I just don't see how guys could do that, you know, after the game, but during the game say, I'm trying to take out your knee. It's, you know, it, make, it makes no sense. So if, it, if that is the case, then shame on them. That's not the right way to play the game. But I certainly hope it's not. How would you explain the mindset of just trying to continuously improve? Well, I, I think being never satisfied. You know, that's, that's one way to always try to improve. And I always felt like, you know, to, you never look back on what you have done. You're always looking forward on the next challenge in your life or on the field or whatever it may be. And that's how you continue to improve because I always said to myself, if I look back, somebody may catch me and I might realize 
what I've done. You know, where if I don't ever look back and I continue to, to focus on what's in front of me and the challenge ahead, then I can always stay focused on what I haven't done instead of what I have done. Your uh, preparatory yeah. academy uh, it's had a bit of a shift yeah. in uh, recent time. Talk a little bit about the change that you decided to make. And I understand it was kind of two years in the making. Yeah, we, you know, this preparatory academy was something that, you know, it was in the making when I was still playing. And it came about because, you know, I was one of them athletes that, I, mean, I wasn't a five-star athlete, uh, probably wasn't even a four. I was more like a three-star. And coming out of high school, you know, the five-star and the four-star athletes are the kids that they get walked right through the system. You know, some of the coaches and the, uh, recruiters tell them when to take the test, tell them what grade point average they need to have to, to uh, accept a scholarship to their school. But it's the two-star athletes and the three-star athletes that sometimes uh, get lost in the shuffle. You know, they, no one is looking at them. They, they still may be good enough to, to go to school and possibly get a scholarship to maybe a Division I smaller school or maybe a Division I AA, you know. And, but they don't know how to go about the process of getting recognized or they don't know, you know, a lot of them are not prepared for taking the test, the ACT or the SAT, you know, their core courses. A lot of them don't have the right core courses in, in high school. And so we, we thought of coming up with, you know, um, you know, an academy that's not a school, but being a resource for these student athletes, as well as the parents and even the coaches, where we will help them with their process. We would, you know, tell them everything that they need to know, walk them through the process of taking the ACT, the SAT, monitoring their core courses online, their parents can monitor their core courses, you know, really give them the best opportunity to get a scholarship. You know, reaching out to colleges for them, making highlight films for them, you know, helping them try to get that scholarship. We have like uh, four day football uh, mini camps that we have every year, you know, seven on seven tournaments, you know, that, that brings exposure to the kids in the academy. So we have different things that we do as well in helping build the skill side of these student athletes. Do you have a long term goal for like what you'd like it to? become? Yeah, actually, I, I would love to, you know, eventually have it become nationwide where, you know, because ultimately, you know, we're like high school advisors as well because we can, we can monitor their core courses. You know, we can really help these student athletes be prepared for college um, way before their senior year because a lot of people don't realize that you can be qualified for college you know, before your senior year, you can get 33% of your core courses done by your freshman year. And a lot of, I didn't know that when I was in high school that I can get 33% of my core courses done by my freshman year. And so a lot of people just, you know, take all these electives and, you know, really wait too late to, to qualify. And then they find themselves going to a JUCO or going to a community college or something like that. How well do you recall the, the home that you grew up in? Oh, you know, I, I can recall it, you know, um, you know, like it was yesterday. I mean, it's, What did it look like? Well, it was just a, a small, modest home, it, you know, um, three bedrooms, you know, family room, nice little kitchen. Uh, probably about a little over 2,000 square feet, you know, if that. Had a nice backyard where, you know, I used to ride my homemade go-kart that my <laughs> stepfather put together for me. Ride that go-kart all around that backyard. You know, had a trampoline back there where when my mom was gone, I used to climb up on the house, jump off the house, <laughs> do, do flips off the house onto the trampoline, you know, just doing stuff like that. How about your favorite feature of your San Diego home? The backyard. You know, the backyard, having a nice pool. Uh, but my favorite place in the backyard was, you know, the uh, putting green that I had. 
along with the chipping area. Mm -hmm. And then I had a, uh, a, a four-wheeler track, dirt bike track, where I can kind of ride the, my four-wheeler around my property in, in San Diego. You just moved back to Texas. Uh, I know you're renting right now, but what are you looking for in the home for yourself? Just a, a nice big yard for my kids to, to be able to play. You know, I, I envision I'm gonna have to set up uh, soccer goals and you know, even maybe one day a batting cage, you know, and possibly even, you know, a mini football field to, to work with, you know, my son. And who knows, I don't expect my daughter to be a football player, but maybe she likes, <laughs> maybe she likes soccer, yeah. you know. And so I, I just envision having a, a big enough yard to, you know, to be able to, um, to keep my kids active and playing.